So the subject is the holiness of God. And again, we're in chapter 7 of uh, Terry Johnson's Identity and Attributes down there. So I, ho- I hope you read this chapter because there was, um, there was things in this chapter that um, I had never thought about. And I'm so thankful because um, I, I want to keep learning. I want to keep growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. But there's something that, there's some things that Terry Johnson pointed out in the book, particularly how the holiness of God has been in our day and in the last 150 years really pushed, pushed to the background. And instead, the emphasis has been on different attributes of God that are more appealing to, to men. So let's... Uh, Let's get into this study here. There is sometimes an apprehension in people's minds whenever God is brought up in conversation, but especially among unbelievers. The world of unbelieving men either shy away from the subject, ignore it, or even rail against it. Why is that? Why are men so inclined to suppress God whenever he is brought up? Is it because God is love? Is it because God is merciful? Is it because God is wise? Perhaps it's because God is all-powerful or all-present. Is this why men want to push God out of their lives? I I don't think so. In chapter 7 in the book, we um, I'm convinced that the primary reason men don't like God, don't like to hear about him, and thus ignore him, is because he's holy. Martin Luther misunderstood the holiness of God, and it nearly drove him insane at the monastery. When he studied Romans and read about the justice of God, he thought it only meant that that justice whereby God punishes sinners. And and Luther was greatly troubled. But as he continued to study, the Lord opened his eyes to see that the justice of God that Paul spoke about was the justice whereby he justifies sinners by faith according to his mercy. So God opened Luther's eyes to see that the holy justice of God and the holy mercy of God come together in the cross of Christ. And it was at this point that Luther said he felt that he was reborn. But Luther admitted that God terrified him with thoughts of hell before he showed him mercy. Luther did not give up his quest to understand who God is, and we mustn't either. Even though there are difficult things to understand about God, even though when we come to God, when we hear his word preached, or when we read it, or when we pray, it exposes us, it convicts us. This should not hinder our pursuit of God. The reason so many are afraid or ignorant of God is because God exposes us. The light of his holiness shines in the darkness of our hearts. It exposes our sin with perfect precision and exactness. God's holy standard that we find in his word is a mirror. It is the only accurate representation of ourselves. We look at it and we see how awesome and beautiful God is. And then we look at ourselves and we see our failure. We see our shortcoming. We see sin. Remember when the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah and his wife in the book of Judges? Do you remember that story? Manoah was Samson's father. And the angel of the Lord, who I believe was the pre-incarnate Christ, appears to Manoah's wife first and says that she was going to have a son. Now, Manoah's wife was barren. She couldn't have children. But the angel of the Lord said that they would be given a son who would deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, at first, Manoah's wife came back to Manoah and told, told him all that the angel of the Lord had told her. And so Manoah prays, oh Lord, you know, 
please tell me more about this child that we're going to have. Um, so the Lord appeared again to the woman, and then she came and got her husband, Manoah. And Manoah um, and uh, his wife speak with the angel of the Lord. Now, after this, they, um, Manoah wanted to give the angel of the Lord a meal, and the, and the angel of the Lord said, no, um, but you can, you, can make, you can give me an offering. So that's what they do. They give him an offering, they, a, a burnt offering and a grain offering. And as it's burning up, the angel of the Lord goes, <laughs> hovers over the offering and ascends up into the sky. Now that terrified Manoah. And I want us to think about Manoah's response. He said, we will surely die for we have seen God. He's terrified. But Manoah's wife had a little bit more sense than he did. And she said to Manoah, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands. Nor would he have shown us all these things. Nor would he have let us hear the things like this at this time. So yes, Manoah, it is awesome and terrible to see God. But you're taking it too far, his wife said to him. You're taking it too far. This was not like God's visit to Sodom and Gomorrah. No, it was different. And it wouldn't be the last time the Son of God came down to earth. John, in the New Testament, says of Christ coming to earth in the Incarnation, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The holiness of God is great and awesome and dreadful. But its effect on men is not only to expose sin, but it is also to purify and sanctify us. God is holy, perfectly holy, but we are not. But aren't all Christians holy? Yes, they are. But they're not holy in the same way that God is. Although we are made holy in the Lord as believers, we aren't holy in the same way that God is because God is intrinsically holy. He always was, always is, and always will be holy. He can never be more holy than he is now. He can never be less holy than he is now. He's always holy. He's perfectly holy. We are becoming holy if we believe in Christ and have the Spirit of God. We're becoming. But God does not become. He is. He, he said to Moses, I am what I am, not I will be what I will be. So I will attempt this evening to teach on the holiness of God, what it is, the different ways that we can see it, and then to speak about the holiness of the people of God. So what is the holiness of God? I want us to take a trip for a minute. We all like going on trips. I was just telling my dad, my, <laughs> I was just telling Keith that my dad was, went on a trip a couple days ago out to Nebraska, a last minute trip. Um, I wanna go on a trip to Nebraska, that sounds like a lot of fun, but let's go on a trip to heaven, okay? Let's look at what the scriptures show us is holiness. Let's see the frame that's captured there. So ter let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, each having six wings. With two each covered his face, with two each covered his feet, and with two each flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, 
and atonement is made for your sin. What do we see in heaven? We see a world of holiness. Everything about the place is holy. All the persons there are holy. Whether saints or angels, they are all holy. All the activity up there is holy. No sin is allowed. It is forbidden. Everything is pure and clean, right and true. There is a great solemnity about the place as well. But most importantly, it is the place of God's throne, where the seraphim above it never cease to cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That is what we would see if we were to get a glimpse of heaven. We would see God in his perfect holiness and all his subjects thinking, speaking, and acting in holy ways. It is no wonder that heaven is separated from earth, or rather that the holy world of heaven is separated from the sinful world of earth. It is a place altogether different. It is altogether antithetical to the place where we live. So what is holiness? How are we to understand it? According to David Wells, holiness in God is everything that sets him apart from his sinful creation. And and it's everything that elevates him above it in moral splendor. So let let me read that again. Holiness in God is everything that sets him apart from sinful creation and elevates him above it in moral splendor. So to begin with, there's the idea of separation. What kind of separation? Again, it's a separation from sin. God is separate from sin, completely and entirely. And not only that, he hates and despises it. He condemns it. But he also cannot be touched by it or tempted by it. He is separate from sin and is enthroned high above sin in his moral splendor. Jonathan Edwards is helpful here. When he describes God's holiness, he says, quote, It is the excellency and beauty of God's nature whereby his heart is disposed and delights in everything that is morally good and excellent. God is the infinite fountain of purity and holiness in an infinitely pure flame that shines with pure brightness, such that the heavens appear impure when compared with him. End quote. So according to Edwards, Holiness is a beautiful thing. The Bible also attests to this in the Psalms when it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So for us to imagine holiness only as something dreadful in God is to only see one side of it. The holiness of God is a beautiful thing. We see God's holiness expressed in moral purity and moral excellence. But moral purity, moral purity and moral excellence are beautiful things. They're not ugly, right? If someone was morally pure, if they were morally excellent, would we say, that's a disgusting person? No. Well, God is perfectly holy. He's perfectly pure in his morals. Now, Terry Johnson mentions that the holiness of God is different from all the rest of God's attributes. In what way? Well, he says that Holiness is the attribute of attributes. The attribute of attributes. He he says that it is preeminent of all of God's attributes. In what way is it preeminent? Now this is where I really had to pay attention, okay? And I'm going to try to, I'm going to explain this, what Johnson says, and then I'm going to try to break it down um, in a way that even I can understand it. It's not super complicated, but... um, I mean, we're talking about God, okay? So it's not easy either. (laughs) So Johnson comments that the seraphim do not repeat grace, 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 love, 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 wrath, wrath, wrath. But what do they repeat? Holy, holy, holy. Why? Because holiness is the sum of all of God's attributes. And interestingly, in the Old Testament, we see that the word holy is the choice adjective that's used to describe who God is more than all the other attributes 
uh, than all the other uh, attributes combined. And if you look at the back of the pew that's in front of you, you see a black book with the inscription, Holy Bible, not loving Bible, not merciful Bible, not vengeful Bible, but Holy Bible. So how are we to think about this? Well, I think this means that if we had to use one word to describe God, that word would undoubtedly have to be the word holy. No other word would do. And this is so far from the response of many Christians today who would say, if I was to ask them, what is one word that you would use to describe God? And now I want you to respond. What is one word that probably they would say? What? Say it louder. I'm sorry. Love? Holy? Judy, Judy thinks they would say holy. Maybe some would. Maybe some would. But I think that most people would say God is love. I mean, that, that's what I hear a lot of Christians say. I'm not saying necessarily in this church, but, um, but sure, I'm sure some do. Um, now, this, this is really ignorant. It's, it's an ignorance of Scripture. Because, because God is love, but the word that, that would most describe who He is is holy. God is holy. We must know who God is as He is revealed in His word. And we must take all of Scripture, not just part of it, or else... Or else we make an idol. So is God's holiness better than all his other attributes? Is that what I'm saying? If, if we were to put them in some sort of chronological order, okay, should we put like holiness at the top and then maybe love and mercy down below it a little bit and then at the bottom his wrath? It, how, how would we do that? Is that how we're supposed to think about it? I don't think so. While it's true that holiness is an attribute of God, it's also true that it is an attribute that is connected to every other attribute. In other words, all of God's attributes are holy attributes. His wisdom is a holy wisdom. His mercy is a holy mercy. His justice is a holy justice. All of his attributes are holy. And holiness is beautiful. So this means that holiness gives luster and glory to all of his other attributes. Now, I would, like, I would like to attempt to illustrate this, and I hope I'm not undermining what I'm saying by this illustration, but I'm, I, I, this helped me understand um, the technical language in the book. So I hope it's helpful to you. So let's imagine that each one of God's attributes was a statue. Okay. First, there's a statue of justice, and then there's a statue of wisdom, and then there's a statue of love and mercy, okay? So there's a bunch of statues that all represent his attributes. Every statue is solid gold, pure gold. Now, the form of the statues are the different attributes. However they're shaped, those are the attributes. But the substance of those statues is pure gold. That would be like the holiness of God. So to put it another way, it's what makes all of God's, um, it, it's what, so holiness is what makes God's attributes pure and glorious. And if there was to be statues of you and I, the different attributes would have their different forms, but what would they be made of? Clay, maybe a little iron mixed in there. Not very beautiful, not very strong. You would see the form, but there would be very little glory to any of them. I don't know if that helps, but that was something that I thought, I thought up. Um, you, can, you can challenge me on that later. But now let's look at four ways that God's holiness can be seen. Four ways that God's holiness can be seen. Terry Johnson says that there are four specific ways that God reveals his holiness. What are they? First, the law of God. Second, the attitude of God towards good and evil. Third, the Son of God. And fourth, the people of God. 
Now let's examine each one of these. So first, the holiness of God's law. Did you know that God's law is holy? Paul says that the law is holy and just and good. Romans 7.12 What this means is that the law is the written down standard of holiness. The law of God is not just what God expects of us and what he expects of society. It is certainly that. But the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is the holiness of God. It's what holiness is. According to Richard Baxter, an English Puritan, the law of God is the rule of holiness. And William Shedd, the moral law is the most important and clearest expression of the divine holiness. So if someone, wants to, if someone was to ask us, what is holiness? The correct answer would be the Ten Commandments. It would also be true to say that a holy man would be a man who keeps the Ten Commandments. So if someone were to say that such a person was holy, they would be correct, yet only insofar as if they keep God's law. But if they don't keep the law, if they reject it for whatever reason, no matter how good they appear to be, no matter how nice they are. They, they aren't holy. We can't reject God's holy standard and then pretend to be living in an acceptable manner before God. God accepts what he prescribes, not what we invent. Holiness is clearly defined for us, specifically defined for us in the Ten Commandments. Couldn't be clearer. It's what God expects of us when he says, Be holy, for the Lord your God is holy. This means be keeping God's law. The law of God is holy. God's holy attitude towards sin is the other thing, the other way in which we can see the holiness of God. Holiness is also revealed to us in God's attitude towards sin and righteousness. What does God think of righteousness? Terry Johnson says that he loves righteous deeds and the Lord loves justice and he surrounds himself with holy angels and he creates for himself a holy people. Evil has no place in the mind of God or in the dwelling place of God. Sin cannot be part of God because he is infinitely and eternally holy. It may be hard for us to think of such, to think of a being with so much love for righteousness, but just think, God cares so much about this that his dwelling place is kept separate from sin. We have our dwelling places and we keep them a certain way. We keep them clean and tidy. We don't let certain things in our homes. Some things aren't allowed there. It's the same for God. He is supremely concerned that his dwelling place is righteous and that nothing sinful or abominable is there. God's mind is, whole, is a holy mind and his dwelling a holy dwelling for righteousness. So that's God's attitude towards righteousness. What about God's attitude towards sin? He hates it. But let's just listen to some verses that describe his attitude towards sin. And this is directly from the book. The strongest language in the Bible is used of God's abhorrence of sin. We are told that God hates all who do iniquity and abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. That God is indignant towards sin. That he hates evil and perjury. That he hated Judah's idolatry. That he hated Israel's unrighteous festivals and feasts. Also, he hates pride, the lying tongue, murder, false witnesses, troublemakers, and those who hurry towards evil. He hates divorce, end quote. And the list could go on. But the holy attitude of God is completely intolerable towards sin. He not only can't stand it, he doesn't stand it. Because God is almighty, he is above sin. He cannot be tempted by it. He is so far above sin and iniquity that it doesn't even come close to him. Do we, understand, do we understand this idea that God is so great that he can't even be touched by sin? It's so detestable in his sight. 
his perfect and holy mind would never, it could never allow sin to, to, to stain him, to touch him. That is why God is so holy. Yes, as the seraphim said, three times holy. He is above sin in all of his attributes, in all of his actions. Thirdly, we see the holiness of God, we see holiness in the holiness of God's Son. If we want to see the perfect embodiment of holiness, look at Christ. He himself exemplified perfectly God's holiness in his human body. Christ embodied holiness. Every thought, every word, every deed of Christ was holy. He taught us how to be obedient to the holy law of God, how to resist temptation, how to consider others as more important than ourselves, and how to love sacrificially. Every aspect of God's law was perfectly and completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There wasn't one part in which he fell short. He fulfilled the law, and all that he did was done in holiness. And the greatest example we can find in the Bible of God's hatred of sin and love of holiness is in the cross. In order to preserve holiness and punish sin at the same time, he sent his one and only Son to bear the wrath of God for sin. Now, can we we park here for a minute or two? Um, There was a really good quote in the book by Thomas Boston on this point, and I'm going to read this. It's a little long, but it's good, so I, I think you'll like it. Quote, Here his love to holiness and his hatred of sin is most conspicuous. All of the demonstrations that God ever gave of his hatred of sin were nothing in comparison to this. Neither all the vials of wrath and judgment which God has poured out since the world began, nor the flaming furnace of a sinner's conscience, nor the groans and roaring of the damned in hell, nor that irreversible sentence pronounced against the fallen angels, to afford such a demonstration of the divine holiness and hatred of sin as the death and sufferings of the blessed Redeemer. He was the eternal and the only begotten Son of God, the brightness of his Father's glory, the express image of his person. Yet he must descend from the throne of his majesty, divest himself of his robes of insupportable light, take upon him the form of a servant, become a curse, and bleed to death for sin. Did ever sin appear so hateful to God as here? To demonstrate God's infinite holiness and hatred of sin, he would have the most glorious and most excellent person in heaven and on earth suffer for it. He would have his own son die on a disgraceful cross and be exposed to the terrible flames of divine wrath. Rather than sin should live, and his holiness remained forever disparaged by the violations of his law. End quote. So please remember this, brethren. If you're struggling with understanding holiness, if you're having difficulty understanding God's law, then go to Christ. Observe the Son of God in the Gospels. He is the human embodiment of holiness. You're not going to find a better example. Everything that he did Everything that he said was holy. Everything that he did was fulfilling God's law, the Ten Commandments. Never did he break even one of them in thought, word, or deed. Watch how he talks with others. He's being holy. He's fulfilling the law. Watch how he helps others. He's being holy. He's fulfilling the law. Watch how he spends his time. He's being holy. He's fulfilling the law. It may be hard to grasp ideas of holiness given as commands. Although I think the Ten Commandments aren't difficult to understand. I think a child can understand them. But sometimes it's difficult to see the scope of all that the command means and all that it implies. That I, understand, that I get. Because I have difficulty understanding the scope at times. But go to Christ. Here we see a three-dimensional picture of holiness. Here we see color to the black and white. 
So learn, learn from Christ. Pray for the Spirit's power to obey and imitate the Son. And lastly, we see holiness in God's people. We see holiness in God's people. The people of God are holy, or else they are not his people. This is a fact. So often in the New Testament, we hear the biblical writers addressing their subjects as saints. For example, Romans 1.7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, to the saints who are at Ephesus. I could go on. God's people are holy ones. They're saints. Wait, says someone, wait, wait. I thought people only became saints after they died. Not so fast, my Catholic friend. The apostle calls the people of God saints when they are born again, not after they die. It is their spiritual birth certificate which gives them credibility. Not their holiness. Not their life of good works. That's another matter altogether. Yes, it's true that the saints must live holy lives. But living a holy life doesn't make a person a saint. It proves he is one. Then how does a person become a saint? God makes him one. By his doing, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. God made us holy. We didn't make ourselves holy. This was God's plan from all eternity, that is, to create for himself a holy people. In, in Ephesians 1.4, Paul says that, that God's plan was choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So God takes the responsibility of making a holy people for himself through Christ, through his life and death on their behalf. So how are we to see holiness now in the people of God? Well, well as we've been speaking of earlier, we see it in their obedience to his law. As Terry Johnson already pointed out, his law is, his, is a reflection of him, his holiness. Remember, the Ten Commandments are a direct reflection of God's holy character. So the only way that God's people can be truly seen as holy is when their lives show obedience to his law. Now I can hear someone say, you're a legalist, you're a legalist. Oh really? Was Christ a legalist? Was Paul a legalist? Was James a legalist? Because they all obeyed and taught obedience to the law, the perfect law of liberty. Yes, but says one, you believe in work salvation. No, I do not. I never said that. Please don't put words in my mouth, my antinomian friend. I never said that we must keep the law to be saved. I said that we must keep the law to prove that we are saved. Okay? If God's law is a reflection of holiness and God wants us to be holy, then we need to obey his law. Not so that we can be saved, but to prove that we are. That's what I'm saying. And by the way, we cannot keep God's law perfectly. Can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? No. Since the fall, no human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly. That's a fact. But Christ did. He did keep the law perfectly. He did it on our behalf. The difference between the believer and the legalist is the believer is trusting in the perfect righteousness of God's Son, while the legalist is trusting in his own righteousness. Okay? The legalist is trusting in himself. Big difference. We are not perfect, just as Paul said, but this we do, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to what lies ahead. We all stumble badly. Even the best of God's men are men at best. We believe what Paul says in Romans, that what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So away with your antinomianism. We love God's law. It's perfect and pure. It's holy. It is our standard. We know we don't keep it perfectly. When we fail, we confess our sins, and we know that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We unashamedly confess we don't keep God's law perfectly. But this does not prevent us from obedience. This, is, this cannot be used as an excuse. This cannot hinder us from living holy lives. We are not trusting in our own righteousness, because that's filthy rags. But we are trusting in Christ's righteousness. I remember reading about John Bunyan's struggle in his autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And if you've never read that, it's a great book on his struggle with depression and working out his salvation. And he said, one day I was walking in a field depressed, despairing of his soul. Satan attacked him, he said many times. And he said, all of a sudden a thought came to my mind, your righteousness is in heaven. And he said, with that thought, he was lifted out of his despair. Your righteousness is in heaven. And that's the confession of every true saint of God. We would say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Our righteousness is in heaven, it's not in ourselves. But we are made righteous by faith in Christ. Not in ourselves. Okay, so I would warn you in closing that the writer of Hebrews warns his listeners in chapter 12, verse 14, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So no holiness, no heaven, no obeying the law of God, no heaven. No keeping the commands of Christ, no heaven. Am I being clear enough? If there's no holiness in our life, if there's no love for God's law or obedience to it, we're deceiving ourselves. We're not Christians. As Terry Johnson mentioned in the beginning of the chapter, the holiness of God has largely been pushed out of the way in American Christianity and replaced with love and mercy he even goes back to the 1850s and he said, Moody did this. I'm not saying he didn't preach the gospel, but um, <laughs> I love Moody, by the way. I went to Moody Bible Institute. Okay? Moody was one of the greatest evangelists this country ever saw. Okay, besides Whitfield. Next to, below Whitfield, maybe. I don't know, we can argue about that. But, um, but what, what happens when we change the nature of God and when we um, don't talk about the whole counsel of God. What happens is we make an idol. Like the Samaritans who um, Jesus said, you worship a God that you don't know. You're not worshiping God. That's a frightening thing to say. And men have made a God in their own image according to their likeness, according to their desires today. A divine Santa Claus who tolerates sin and doesn't judge or rarely judges men. This is not the God of the Bible. Our God is holy, and not just holy, but to emphasize how holy he is, the scripture says he's thrice holy, three times holy. The holiness of God teaches us that God hates sin and loves righteousness. We see it set in stone in the Ten Commandments. We see it embodied in the person of Christ, who perfectly kept God's law, and we see it in the lives of his chosen ones, saints, who are trying to learn the things that please the Lord, who love his law in the inner man and who imperfectly keep his law. What about you? Are you holy? Do you hate sin in your life and in society? Or are you trying to make peace with sin and tolerate it? 
I pray that you remember the words in Hebrews that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. If you tolerate sin in your life and die in your sins, you will hate heaven. Heaven, you're not going to want to be there. I can guarantee you that heaven is God's home where everything is holy and nothing abominable or evil is allowed there. The saints of God long for heaven, though, because they long to be with Christ. And a heaven without Christ is no heaven at all, right? Where are you going? If you are one of God's chosen ones, then keep pursuing holiness and the fear of the Lord. And as J.C. Ryle said, don't settle for this half and half holiness. Pursue holiness. Keep pursuing it. Always try to be more like Christ. Don't give up when you fail. A wise man is not someone who doesn't make mistakes. He's someone who learns from them. Confess your sins and be cleansed and get up and keep following Christ. Use the Ten Commandments to remind you of what holiness is. And study the Son of God and see holiness in action. God bless you all for Jesus' sake.